I imagine you might have thought we were going to talk about food and how we get hooked on bad food habits that we have difficulty breaking, but actually I thought we would start with something that's much more on everybody's mind, which is how to magnetize a baby. You start with a baby, the baby should be 9 to 12 weeks of age, and you sit face to face, 15 inches apart. You mix one teaspoon of sugar, one cup of water, and mix them together. Take the baby's pacifier, stick it in the sugar water, plunk it in the baby's mouth, and wait for three and a half minutes. When the timer goes off, stop. The baby is magnetized, and you may walk out of the room. Come back in about 10 minutes later with lots of other people, and what you discover is the baby ignores everybody. The baby looks only at you and gurgles and coos and throws you a seductive shoulder and is really looking at you quite adoringly. Now, what has gone on is that the baby's taste buds are set for the mild sweetness of breast milk. And you just applied sucrose, table sugar, to the baby's taste buds. And that triggers a nerve impulse that goes to the base of the brain and Opiate chemicals, cousins of heroin or morphine, are then released in the baby's brain. In turn, they trigger the release of another brain chemical called dopamine, and that is responsible for everything that feels good. And the baby was experiencing this while looking at you. And the baby now associates you with all things that are good. So this is obviously very practical for grandparents. Um, <laughs> they, it doesn't have to be your baby. You can magnetize anyone's baby. Um, Hospitals have been trying this, actually. If you have a newborn, I'm talking about one day of life or second day of life, and you're going to draw a blood sample, the typical technique is you take a little lancet and stick the baby in the heel and you get a drop of blood out. If you dribble some water in the baby's mouth beforehand, the, bi the baby cries just as much as before. But if you put a little sugar into the water and dribble it into the baby's mouth and then stick them, you discover the baby cries much less. What's going on here is that you're triggering the release of opiates which have a mild anesthetic effect in the baby's brain. And this has no effect, however, if mom was a heroin addict. And can you guess why? Because the baby has been bathing in opiates, of course, for nine months, and so your little bit of opiate that's caused from the release of the sugar has no effect, okay? So, so the point being that sugar is essentially a drug. Not necessarily a terribly bad one or a terribly strong one, but it has drug-like effects nonetheless working through the opiate system in the brain. And when we are grown-up babies, this is the kind of sugar that we take advantage of, and we react in our own way. <laughs> well, does it matter? Well, a teaspoon of sugar has only about 15 calories. It's, it's not really a big problem. The problem with sugar, though, is that it gets into everything. It's easy to have large amounts of it piling up. And if you have one of these 20-ounce sodas, that can pack 250 calories of sugar that you didn't need. Now, when I was a kid growing up in North Dakota, we would have sodas every three months or something like that at a picnic or a, a party or something. It wasn't everyday fare. And I remember when the cans came in, <clears throat> our sodas were six-ounce bottles. When the cans came in, my mother would say, I can't finish a whole can of soda. <clears throat> I wish I had something that I could use to seal it up and save it for the next day. Well, today, if you go into any store, the smallest bottle you will find is 20 ounces. <clears throat> this is from, from um, Coca-Cola's nutrition analysis. 68 grams of sugar and almost as much caffeine as a cup of coffee. So if the sugar weren't a drug effect enough, the caffeine adds to it, and a 12 or 14-year-old kid consuming this is effectively hooked. This is from the Coca-Cola website. <laughs> that is a lie. Now, help me out here. T tell me if you spot an addicting food. If you see one, just go ahead and call out. Oh, okay, all right. Nobody called out for broccoli, I noticed. Okay. <laughs> Cauliflower, anyone? Well, okay, all right. This is my friend, Narcan. This is an opiate-blocking drug. A guy is shooting up heroin on the street, and he accidentally misjudges the amount. 
and he shoots up too much heroin and he gets wobbly and he passes out and his friends know what's going on. He's going to die. So they drag him into the emergency room and you find a vein and you inject Narcan, naloxone. It's an opiate blocker. What it does is it stops heroin from being able to affect the brain. So he wakes up and you've saved his life. Now if you gave this very same drug to a chocolate addict, I don't mean a person who likes chocolate, I mean a person who binges and is really throwing it down, you discover the most amazing thing. They take a taste of chocolate and they set it back down. They'll, they'll try it again and they just set it down. It tastes like chocolate, it has the mouth feel of chocolate, it smells like chocolate, but the appeal of it is largely gone. Now, by the way, this is not a treatment. <clears throat> if, if you wanted to do this, you'd have to actually have an IV hookup as you went to the 7-Eleven. But what it shows us is that we, the part that we are aware of is the taste. What is happening in reality is a brain effect in which opiate chemicals are released in response to that taste of chocolate, and that is why we are driven to it, especially at any time when you need a little anesthesia. If you're tired, if you're angry, if you're annoyed, if you're alone, we tend to turn to these foods, especially at that time. It's a drug effect. <clears throat> now, chocolate is not just sugar. A, a true chocolate addict is not going to be happy with a, a box of Domino sugar. Chocolate has caffeine in it. It has theobromine. In, have you heard of this? Anybody have dogs? Anybody have dogs? Okay. Did, did your vet ever say, don't give your dog chocolate? Theobromine is a mild stimulant for humans, but it can be fatal to dogs, and so that's, that's what's going on there. Phenylethylamine is an amphetamine-like compound that's in chocolate, it's in sausage, it's in cheese. And anandamide is the compound in the brain that is affected by THC. I'm talking about the active ingredient in marijuana. The anandamide is the brain chemical that's turned on by that. Chocolate causes that effect to persist. So chocolate isn't really a drug. It's the whole drugstore sort of wrapped up uh, all in one. Now, we recently did a research study. By we, I mean Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, along with our friends at Georgetown University. <clears throat> and we had 59 overweight postmenopausal women who came into the study, and we were going to test the effect of diet on their weight. And we randomized them into two groups. One group got what you'd think of as a, a healthy, balanced American-type diet no more than six ounces of meat per day, mostly chicken and fish, generally low fat. And the experimental group went on a vegan diet. Now, this was a new word to a lot of folks. They imagined vegans are people from the planet Vegas. <laughs> and we had to explain that this is different from ovo, lacto, vegetarians, ovo meaning eggs, lacto meaning, meaning milk. And once in a while I run into somebody who says, I'm, I'm pretty much vegetarian but I do have eggs and I have milk and I have fish and I have chicken sometimes and I once in a while have red meat but hardly ever and I call them the ovo lacto pesco polo vegetarians <clears throat> but anyway this group was this was a, a vegan group they weren't vegans coming in but we asked them to follow a vegan diet and they did great I have to tell you they did wonderfully after 14 weeks we compared both groups the vegans lost substantially more weight their waistlines trimmed down their cholesterols went down we had a few people who were diabetic at the start. None of them were diabetic by any standard diagnostic test We had 14 weeks. But I asked them, what do you miss now? And I thought they would say, I miss chocolate ice cream or a cold glass of milk with some cookies or a burger. And they didn't say any of that. Can you guess what they missed? They wanted cheese. They were waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning dreaming of cheese pizza with those strings of melty cheese coming down. And I thought, what is... And other people report that too. They miss cheese more than other foods. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I started thinking, why is it... I mean, let's be honest. Cheese does smell a little bit like old socks. Why is it that, that people want this stuff? Well, I started looking into this, and this is actually what propelled me on this quest to figure out about the opiate effects of foods that led to this new book called Breaking the Food Seduction. I found a paper in 1981 written by a researcher at Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. And he had found a substance in dairy products that looks very much like morphine. And he did a variety of biochemical studies and published in Science, the journal Science, in 1981, his conclusion that it is morphine. 
you know, you know poppy plants, opium poppies, they have the enzymes for producing narcotics, opium. And a cow's liver, by a fluke of nature, has similar enzymes that make morphine and codeine. There's not a lot of it, there's just tiny traces, especially in the spring, less in the fall. But the, the amounts are so small, I don't think that's why some people get hooked on dairy. What seems to be more important is something called casomorphins. Have you heard of these? Hey, you've heard of casein, C-A-S-E-I-N, the dairy protein? All proteins are strings of beads. Each bead is an amino acid. Those are the building blocks of protein. In your digestive tract, that protein breaks apart and the individual beads get into your bloodstream and your body can turn them into muscles or skin or internal organs or whatever. But casein does not behave that way. Casein is a long string of amino acids like other proteins, but in the calf's digestive tract, it's broken into not individual amino acids, but strings of four or five or seven. And they're biologically active. They have opiate activity. By that I mean they act like mild narcotic drugs. They're not that strong. The strongest is about one-tenth the power of pure morphine. But if any of you were ever in the hospital and you got a pain-killing uh, pain drug that was in the narcotic class, like morphine or Demerol, the biggest side effect is that you get constipated fairly quickly. Well, if any of you ever did a big cheese overdose, <laughs> that breaks apart into these narcotics, and one of the principal side effects is exactly the same. It's a narcotic-like effect. Now, for chemists in the audience, this is what the casomorphins look like, and it raises the question, what the heck are they doing there? Why would we have opiate compounds in milk? And I want to offer you my theory. My theory is that nature doesn't like leaving anything to chance. If the baby calf did not like nursing and turned away and said, Mom, I'm just going to go wander in the woods today. Or if a breastfeeding baby turned away from the breast, they wouldn't do well. They wouldn't thrive. So nature builds milk with protein and fat and sugar and hormones and growth factors of various kinds and a nice little narcotic effect so that the casomorphins go to the baby's brain and cause a little bit of sedation. And for, for any of you who have ever looked at a baby as he or she is nursing, they get this funny look on their face. And then they doze off to sleep and we think, my lullabies were so compelling. <laughs> I hate to break it to you, you just drugged the kid. And now nature never figured that we would continue consuming milk, but what I'm suggesting is that the mother-infant bond has a biological basis in drug-like compounds and that the human refrigerator bond kind of works the same way. Um, now, is it a good idea to break away from cheese? Well, here are the, the figures. The calorie content of cheese is huge. It's probably the most fattening food that people include in their diets. Two ounces of cheese, which is about as much as you top a sandwich with, has close to 200 calories and lots and lots and lots of fat, mostly the bad fat, the saturated fat. That's the kind that makes your cardiologist get kind of woozy. Um, the cholesterol content is high, too. If you compare it to sirloin steak, ounce per ounce, it's as bad or worse. Okay, did any of you have arthritis or migraines or digestive problems that got better when you got away from dairy products? Anybody experience that? It's the most amazing thing, isn't it? Where people who live for years with these conditions, the doctors do all kinds of expensive tests, and then one day somebody says, why don't you stop dairy products? And suddenly, your body gets back to the way nature wanted it to be. <clears throat> I think this is most important, perhaps not even for adults, for kids. If any of you have known a kid who has migraine headaches, it's the most tragic thing, especially for a kid who gets them frequently. These kids, it, it's not a tension headache. It's not, I've kind of had a bad day. These kids have pounding pain, and it, it throbs all night long and into the next day. These kids don't play. They don't think, they don't read, they don't go to school, they don't do anything. What they do is they lie in the dark, trying to fall asleep. It's because they know that if they can just fall asleep, then they might wake up without the headache. And researchers have found that in about 80% of these kids, you can identify one or more diet triggers. When you take those out of their diet, they never have another headache, or very, very rarely. And the diet triggers for migraines are dairy products, chocolate, eggs, citrus fruits, meat, Wheat, nuts, tomatoes, onions, corn, apples, and bananas. 
Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with a banana. But if you're allergic to strawberries and you get a rash, you can't have strawberries. If bananas trigger a migraine, that's a problem for you. Dairy is at the top of the list. And arthritis, same story. For many, many people, their joints are just grinding, and when they get away from dairy, they get better. Okay. Um, let me take a couple of minutes and talk about something that is really critical. Every cancer researcher in America knows this, and other people, it's, it's not on our collective radar screen, and that's milk and prostate cancer. Have you heard about this? It started out as just an observation. If you compare countries that consume a lot of dairy products versus those that have dairy products very rarely, the Scandinavian countries have quite a lot of dairy. North America, same story. We have a lot of, I have no idea what's causing all of this. No, the doctor knows instantly this is alcoholism, and I'm not going to send you down to the liver specialist and the eye specialist and the dermatologist to look at your nose. What we are going to talk about is how to separate you from this condition that is, from, from this substance that is causing all of these medical conditions. Same doctor's office. A guy walks in. He's had a heart attack. His cholesterol is going up. He has a touch of diabetes. He has high blood pressure, and he's got gout. The doctor now will give him five diagnoses, send him to five specialists, write five different prescriptions, and nobody ever says, wait a minute. It might make sense to think of this as if you are hooked on a substance which is causing all of these to manifest. And when we break that food seduction, all of these things will improve or perhaps even go away. And what I'm suggesting is that is exactly the direction that doctors have to go into. Now, what is the value of breaking the meat seduction? Well, the first is you reverse heart disease, as Dean Ornish has so amply showed. You lose weight. Cancer risk drops by about 40%. And have you seen the new work on breast cancer? Just came out about a couple of weeks ago that animal fat is linked to breast cancer. Now, there are many other contributors, of course, but this is a really important one. Uh, blood pressure. When a person goes on a vegetarian diet, if they have high blood pressure, their blood pressure drops. In many, many cases, you get them off all their drugs and their blood pressure is lower than when they were on medicines. Diabetes improves. We did a pilot study, small study, with individuals with type 2 diabetes, and we used a vegan, low-fat diet. And what we found is that two-thirds of our people came off all their drugs or were able to reduce their dose inside of 12 weeks. And I'm happy to tell you that the National Institutes of Health are now funding us to do a larger study using a vegan diet in 68 individuals with type 2 diabetes we're recruiting right now, and they go on the diet from January through June of 2004. Um, thank you. Thank you. And you've seen, you've seen the new work on Alzheimer's disease suggesting that when cholesterol levels are low and fat intake is low and vegetable and fruit intake is high, that Alzheimer's disease is much less common. Now, here's the bad news. For a lot of folks, they will say, well, I don't eat much red meat, but I eat white meat. Well, the leanest beef is about 29% fat as a percentage of calories. The leanest chicken is about 23. Now, fish vary. Some are lower, some are higher. But broccoli is only 8% fat, and beans are 4% fat. Rice is 1 to 5, a potato maybe 1% fat, until we put the butter and sour cream and cheese doodles and bacon bits on top, and then it gets right back up. Now, I, I have to say, I, I give lectures in different parts of the country, and I've noticed that when you talk about vegetarian diets, there's some places that it doesn't go over too big. I was giving a talk in Lubbock, Texas, a few years ago, and I noticed that I'd been invited to speak at Texas Tech, and I didn't realize when I went there that they have a class there called Swinology 101. It's, it's, an, it's an agriculture school, and the reason people go there is they want to become ranchers. But anyway, I'm talking about how people should do a vegetarian diet that would reverse heart disease and make them live longer, and the audience doesn't like this. And I, I pretty soon notice they're kind of grumbling a lot, and one or two people are heckling me. And I realized here I am in the middle of cattle country advocating a vegetarian diet. But the fact is, my grandpa was a cattle rancher. And my dad grew up on a cattle ranch. And my uncles and cousins are all in that business. So I don't consider them the enemy. I consider them to be people at the same risk as everybody else. And they need this message. So I'm describing to these guys in Lubbock about how particles of cholesterol enter the artery, artery wall and they cause artery blockages to gradually grow. And that causes heart attacks. And we have 4,000 of them every single day. And if we went on a vegetarian diet collectively, that would not happen with that kind of frequency. Well, at this point, the audience is booing. 
And they're you know, just really giving me a hard time. And I, I finally just had to say, look, you guys, you can heckle me as much as you want to. But this process of atherosclerosis, this hardening of the arteries that comes from a lifetime of eating beef and other high-fat foods, it doesn't just cause heart attacks. It can also make you impotent. And I had their complete attention for the rest of my lecture. Now, see, I wasn't making this up. By age 60, one in four American men is impotent. And it's not performance anxiety when you're 60. It's, you see, the, the coronary arteries that go to the heart muscle, if they get artery blockages, uh, you don't get blood and oxygen to the, to the heart anymore, and a portion of the heart muscle dies. That's a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. If you block the arteries to the brain, you get a stroke or a death of the portion of the brain that that artery was leading to. If you block the arteries to any vital organ, are you, are you with me? Okay, all right. You see, see, the male sexual anatomy is this peculiar hydraulic system that it was obviously devised on a Monday because everything goes wrong with it, but you need a good, vigorous blood supply in order for it to, to um, function properly. So anyway, by the way, this is no joke for cardiologists. They know a man in his 50s who develops impotence has a one in four risk of heart attack or stroke within two years. It's just a sign of blocked arteries. So anyway, at the end of my lecture in Lubbock, I had all these guys in snakeskin boots coming up to the front, asking me for my macho tofu recipes and power brown rice. <laughs> I realized I should stop talking about heart attacks because that doesn't motivate people, but we figured out what does. So now I want to give you a little bit of bad news and I want your help. The American Cancer Society is a huge nonprofit organization and their development department has apparently not figured out what their nutritional scientists know. They're sponsoring an event in Atlanta called the Cattle Baron's Ball, which is, has as its principal uh, coordinators the owners of the Buckhead Beef Company. And these are phenomenally wealthy people in Atlanta, and they're trying to raise money for cancer. Now, cancer researchers, if there's one thing that is really clear, it's that individuals who eat a lot of beef have more colon cancer, probably 300% more than other people. Saturated fat is linked to breast cancer, so why is the American Cancer Society doing this? Well, it's not just doing it in Atlanta. They're doing it out here. They're doing them all around the country, having people dress up in cowboy attire and go in, and they are served ribs. And they then give money, and you know where the money goes. We're afraid of telling the truth about cancer. We say, get your mammogram, get screened so that we find it. Now, I want to find cancer if it's there, but I don't want it to be there. Or let's raise money for better treatments. Well, if you've got it, let's treat it. But there's a third step, and that's to prevent it from happening, and that is never going to happen if we don't separate ourselves from the things that cause it. Now, I know that you all know this, but we want, when you get to have a big charity like this, they're afraid of telling the truth. They're willing to beat up on tobacco now because everybody else is. But what we have to say is that we should not have the meat-based diet that we have in America if we ever intend to tackle cancer. So, I've, just this morning, I was on the phone with the chief scientists at the American Cancer Society saying you have to cancel this event or you have to re-theme it. Uh, they were going further. They were actually planning to run live cattle through the streets of Atlanta as a promotional PR stunt, and they're having pig races at, uh, at the event to try to make people get into this theme about agriculture is your friend and so forth, and it's complete nonsense. It has to be stopped. Would you do me a favor? Would you write down that number on your screen? And would you please call them and say, please don't do this. Let's get serious. We have to do what we can to stop cancer. Um, or else, at the end of my presentation tonight, I'm going to give our website, PCRM's website, Click on there, I'll give you all the details there as well, okay? I am quite convinced that if, thank you. They mean well, they just need to hear this message and if we work together, we can get them to do the right thing too. Okay, let's say I want to break free. I'm convinced I'm ready to change my own diet. Well, what do we do? What I suggest you do so we're going to take a three-week period, and during this period of time, we're going to start with a healthy breakfast. Why? Because if your breakfast is really high in fiber, it keeps you full during the morning, so you're less likely to fall prey to the donut tray that is walking by work at about 10.30 that morning. Now, when I was a kid growing up in Fargo, North Dakota, my mom cooked us different kinds of breakfasts. The typical thing was her five kids would get out of bed, and we'd go down to the kitchen, and my mother would take a fork and she would pull hot sizzling bacon strips out of the frying pan and put them on the paper towel to drain. And when the 
bacon was all out of the frying pan, she would carefully pick up that hot pan and tip it over to pour the grease into a jar. And she would take that jar of bacon grease and she didn't stick it in the refrigerator, she put it on the shelf. Now why don't you have to refrigerate bacon grease? Because when it cools down, what happens? It solidifies. That is a sign it's loaded with saturated fat. That's the stuff that increases your cholesterol level, leading to heart attacks. So the next day, my mother would take that jar off the shelf, and she'd spoon it, the grease back in the pan and fry eggs in it for her kids. And it's amazing that any of us live to adulthood, as I reflect on it now. <laughs> Problem was, that's a very seductive meal at the time, but there's no fiber in it. Eggs don't have fiber. Fiber means plant roughage. So at 10 o'clock in the morning, her kids were all hungry again. Well, you're a growing boy. You ought to have a good appetite. You ought to be hungry. Wait a minute. If you give that same kid a big bowl of old-fashioned oatmeal that's high in fiber with cinnamon and raisins and some sliced strawberries, they're not hungry, and you can measure how much they snack. It's noticeably less later in the day. You give them a high-fiber lunch, same story. Okay, secondly, you want to choose foods that keep your blood sugar steady. I'm thinking of the bean group, beans, peas, lentils, green leafy vegetables. Fruits are okay. Pasta is actually okay. A lot of folks are afraid of pasta, but if you measure a person's blood sugar, it does not spike and fall the way something like white bread may cause it to do. Uh, for dieters, some dieters shoot themselves in the foot by eating too little. If you don't eat enough food, you binge later. So use the rule of 10. All this is is you take your ideal body weight, multiply by 10, and the number that gives you is your calorie minimum. So like for me, let's say I should weigh 150 pounds times 10, that's what? 1,500. I can eat more calories than that, but I should never eat less than that because if I do, I'm definitely set up for a binge. I'm a bigger guy. I should weigh 200 pounds. I need at least 2,000 calories. If, I ever go, if I'm ever restricting and dieting and counting every last calorie, never go below your rule of 10. Better off, you really don't have to count calories at all if you're on a healthy, low-fat vegan diet. Now, craving cycles... If every day about 4 o'clock you're plugging the quarters into the candy machine, or every night at 8 o'clock your refrigerator is magnetic, you need to forget about food. You need to focus on time. From about an hour before to an hour after your time vulnerability period, do something that is inconsistent with eating. Go for a walk, go to the gym, go to the movies, if somebody will escort you past the concession. And what you'll find is in a couple of weeks, foods never scream out at you to quite that degree. If you're a young woman and you have a monthly cycle where chocolate screams out at you at that special time of the month, we did a study a couple of years ago where we used a low-fat, vegan, high-fiber diet in a group of 33 young women as a means of tackling menstrual pain. And all it does is very low-fat foods reduce the amount of estrogen in the blood so that you don't have these ups and downs of estrogen. At the, at the end of the month, the hormone shifts are not so pronounced. Cramps are reduced. PMS is reduced. Cravings are reduced. Unless you had a double bacon cheeseburger any time in the month, in which case there's enough fat to increase the estrogen production right back up and you run into problems at the end of the month. Okay, um, exercise and rest. A lot of us really don't exercise much during the day. And as a result, when we lie down to sleep, our brains are kind of wired, but our bodies aren't really fatigued, so we don't sleep very soundly. But if you look at kids, you know, kids run around all day, and they lie down to sleep, and they're like comatose. Well, if you get some more exercise in your routine, go to bed just 10 minutes early. What you find is you wake up the next day with a little bit better uh, resolve against the cravings that might come by. So if you put all, the, all of these things together, you start with a healthy breakfast, you're eating an adequate amount of food, you're holding your blood sugar steady, and you feel well-rested. The cravings just don't matter to you so much. But there's two other things that I think are important to do. One is don't do it alone. Grab somebody else and say, you know, we are cheese addicts. Let's go together to the Betty Ford Cheese Clinic, and we're going to get fixed. Um, social support really matters. And also, other motivators. If I'm telling an 18-year-old kid, that he should avoid dairy products, and if he does, he won't get prostate cancer. He just stares at me blankly. An 18-year-old young man, he doesn't have a prostate. <laughs> or, well, if he does, he doesn't know where it is. And, and he's not sure how to spell it. But, but on the other hand, an 18-year-old kid is an environmentalist. They don't eat meat for that reason. Or they're an animal rights activist, and they've heard the numbers. Americans now eat one million animals per hour. 
And for young folks, that means more to them than anything. Or if I have a 40-year-old guy who quit smoking, he, he, didn't, he, not, he did not quit smoking for himself. He quit smoking for his wife and his kids because he knew he can't risk his health. So if you have a little talk about what are we doing with our diets, we're not doing our families any favors by risking illness in ourselves. So whatever your motivators are, you just plug them in. Your body doesn't care why you choose them. Okay. All right, I'm ready to do this, but I'm a little scared about making a lifetime commitment. Well, sure, you don't have to. You just make a commitment for about three weeks. That we can do. So during a three-week period, if you're new to any of this, you use the new four food groups, and that means grains, the legume group, the bean group, vegetables and fruits, and all the wonderful foods that they turn into. I like to, to encourage people to take a multiple vitamin for vitamin D, which ought to come from the sun, but for a lot of folks in parts of the country where there is not much sun or they're working indoors all day long, the vitamin will give them that and vitamin B12. And before you start your three-week period, do a little experimenting and figure out which foods you might like. So these are some from Breaking the Food Seduction, but there are many, many more out there, many wonderful choices of, of books that will guide you along. And then once you're ready and you know what you're going to have, do it 100%. If you're now ovo-lacto, now's the time to go vegan. If you're not yet ovo-lacto, now's the time to go all the way and get all that stuff out of your diet. Don't stick your toe in the swimming pool. Jump in and see what the water is like. And, and the reason I say that is if you have a healthy meal on Wednesday and another one on Sunday, your cholesterol does not fall. You don't lose an ounce. If you have diabetes, it does not get better. It works to do it all the way. But you only do it for three weeks. Now. The nice thing about this is what you weren't expecting is that three weeks is all the time you need to adapt. Think back. How many of you ever switched from whole milk to skim milk? Let me see. Okay, when you did, how did the skim milk taste at first? Watery, kind of horrible. Um, but then after three weeks, what happens? It tastes okay? Okay. Did you ever go back and then have whole milk again? What did that taste like? It's thick, it's greasy, it's creamy. Well, your whole life it was okay until you had a three-week break from it, and now you can't drink it anymore. I'm going to tell you a secret. Your taste buds have what is, for all intents and purposes, a little thermostat that is your food preference. You have one for fat, one for sugar, and one for salt. And it's set based on what they have been in touch with over the preceding five or six days. So if you go low salt tomorrow, I guarantee you'll hate it. If you stick with it, you will adapt, and then you will not let, you know, you'll go to the movies and somebody will put all kinds of salt on the popcorn, you can't eat it. If you go to a totally low-fat vegan diet, and, you're, and this, is not, this, if this is not your routine, for the first day or two, it seems odd, it seems too light. But you start to adapt, and then after three weeks, you go out and say, I'm going to have that double bacon cheese monster burger. And you do, and it doesn't really taste like what you had hoped. The preferences for today are set by what you had yesterday. And so that's why we have a clean break, but just for a short period of time. And the last tip is actually something that my mom taught me. My mom lives in Fargo, North Dakota with my dad, and she had a very high cholesterol level. And I kept encouraging her to change her diet and she would not pay any attention to me. And for a long time this went on, she just ignored all my advice, and I finally realized why this was. And the reason is I'm her third-born child. Are, are any of you third-born children? Okay, is this not true? Your parents never paid an, a, attention to anything you ever said. <laughs> you see, the first, the first the, you know this is true, the first child you pay a lot of attention to them. The first nonsense syllables they utter, you write it down, you call grandma. And when they take their first steps, you take a lot of pictures. And you know, your fo the photo album is page after page after page after page of child number one. And then child number two comes along. There's very few pages of that kid because they've seen what dribbling toddlers are like. Now, the third born child, you can be looking at your mom in the eye and you can say, mom, you've got hypercholesterolemia. You probably have atherosclerosis. She just thinks it's cute, you know, big words. That's it. She's paying no attention at all. So anyway, my mom goes to her doctor. He says, Mrs. Barnard, sit down. You've been dealing with this high cholesterol level for too long. I'm writing a prescription for you now for some cholesterol-lowering medication. I want you to take it. She says, okay. How long for? And he says, I don't think you get it. You're going to take this medication for the rest of your life. And she says, well, wait a minute. 
I have to think this over. And she goes home, and she picks up a book that I wrote called Food for Life. And Neil told me that if I made these recipes, my cholesterol level would fall. She, she does it. My mom becomes a vegan. And six weeks later, she's been a vegan this whole time, she goes back to her doctor. Her cholesterol has dropped 80 points. The doctor, this is a true story, the doctor thought he had a lab error. And he's explaining this to her. She goes, thanks, got the message, bye. She has a totally normal cholesterol level. She goes home, she picks up the phone, she says, Neil, why didn't you tell me about this before? <laughs> so anyway, my mom's, the, the, the light bulb has gone off in her head. She's decided the whole world ought to be vegan. My, my mom is 79 years old. She's decided that everybody ought to be vegan, especially my dad. But the thing is, my dad grew up on a cattle ranch. But on the other hand, he was part of this generation where they, the men don't know where the kitchen is in the house. He's been sitting at the dining room table for 55 years, and the plates of food just come in. And when he's, when he's done, the plates go away. And he has never shopped a day in his life, and he's never made a single meal. So my mom takes advantage of that fact. She goes to the health food store. And by the way, if you haven't been to the health food store lately, it's safe to go back. They have stopped playing folk music. The guy behind the counter is not named Sunshine. He doesn't have a tie-dyed shirt. The soy milk is not a powder anymore. Do you remember you, you, had to, you had to mix it up and pour it really fast before it precipitated? Well, they've got great products there now. They've, my mom buys hot dogs that are not dogs, and she buys sliced turkey and chicken that's really made of soy or wheat. It's not really turkey or chicken. And she gives these all to my father. He has a, a hot dog that he knows is a little bit lighter taste, but it's fine. She must be doing that whole milk, skim milk thing on him again. And she'll make him a bologna sandwich that's a good bread and phony bologna and sliced tomatoes and cucumbers and lettuce and a little Dijon mustard, and she'd give it to my dad, and he's happy with it. He's, they've been doing this for five or six years. And I've now got two vegetarian parents, and only one of them actually knows it. <laughs> so anyway... I was, just, I was just home in Fargo, and my mom is now the official vegan police. My, my brother has two college-age kids, and if you come home with a McDonald's bag, she throws it out of the house. She says, you don't smoke here, and you don't eat that stuff. And you know what? She, and I got to tell you, she, she'll bring them into the kitchen. So she'll say, will you cut the carrots up? And will you, you know, the little ones, will you do the like, lettuce and tear it up? And she doesn't let them eat meat and, at all. And she's got them tasting soy milk and encouraging them along. And you know, she's not that hot of a cook, really. But... But they get into this, and the most wonderful thing happens. Because she did not shut up and take her drug, she learned the cause of this and changed her own life and decided that she wanted to be a little bit of a rabble-rouser with the other people around her. She's affecting their lives. And, and we sit around the table and talk about, well, what really causes osteoporosis? Do you need milk or not? And, and you know, when I was a kid, we never talked about any of this stuff. And that's what's happening. And, that, for me, has, has made me think a lot about how I want to do our work. At Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and, and a special thank you to all of you who are members. I appreciate that very, very much. Um, and for those of you who aren't, please do join us. We do research studies. We do a lot of advocacy work. We're forever fighting the government. And if, if we need to, we sue them. Um, as you know, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans are, are being reformulated right now. The last time of the 11 members on the committee, six of them had ties to the dairy industry, meat industry, or egg industry. We sued them. And in federal court, I'm happy to say we won. The judge said that, that these guidelines were basically drawn together out of public view in an inappropriate way. Um, but it takes a long time to turn this big battleship, and we're fighting much the same battle right now. So if we collectively fail, then the the, the price is not really paid by us. The biggest price is going to be paid by the generation under us. If you have looked at kids in school today, they are more out of shape than any generation in the history of our country. If you, look inside, if you could look inside their arteries, they have the beginnings of artery blockages before they get their high school diploma. We are now seeing type 2 diabetes. I mean adult onset diabetes in kids of 18. We are seeing unprecedented obesity in children. And fast forward a few years. The cancer rates will be unprecedented, and we won't be able to afford it in dollars for health care, let alone the personal tragedy that we're causing. But on the other hand, if we do create a bit of a ruckus, if we fight 
for healthier foods for our kids in schools if we try to get the junk out of, uh, out of what they're eating. And, and parents, we all have a real challenge, let's face it, it's a tough battle, because you're battling the schools, the TV, the, the convenience stores, and everywhere else. But we have the tools to do it. If we work together, we really will be able to take it into our hands the power of healthy eating. Thank you very much. Thank you.